Good afternoon. About 20 years ago, I was sitting on the back porch of our house in Portland, Oregon. I was an electrician, and uh, I was reading through Hebrews, and I came to chapter 11, to the passage where the writer of Hebrews gets to the end of himself, at the end of the passage there, and he says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in goatskins and sheepskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And as I came to those words in that passage right there, it's just, I want to live a life not wasted. And at that point, I just remember just feeling, Lord, I want to do whatever you want me to do, whether that's continuing on to be an electrician in Portland, Oregon. I want to wire houses to your glory and use my spare time to preach the gospel and make disciples, plant churches, support missions, do whatever it takes to make Christ's name great. A few years later, the Lord opened up the doors for us to be able to go to Peru. The Lord has blessed us there and enabled us to be able to start a few, a few churches and um, Bible institutes. Um, when Amy and I first went to Peru in 1996, we went with about 15 other people from Portland, Oregon on a missions trip uh, to visit some of the missionaries there. And at the end of the trip, it was a spectacular time. It was great. Uh, but at the end of the trip, uh, sitting on the plane, I told Amy next to me, I said, I would never want to live in a country like that. A few years later, the Lord completely transformed my, my heart, and uh, the Lord led us to Peru long term, and uh, it's been an exciting, exciting ride. We work and uh, we lived in Tarapoto for several years, many years. It's a jungle town where um, it's close to the Wajaga River, which is a tributary to the Amazon. Um, it's in the jungle. Uh, we ado adopted about 30 villages along that river where uh, some assemblies were already planted and we began to visit those assemblies in those villages and then began to uh, plant uh, uh, some, some assemblies in some of the other villages around. Um, I always go in with a team of guys uh, taking several sisters, several brothers in with me in normal, a typical day going from village to village. Uh, you'll spend 24 hours in one village, but uh, usually you arrive, you'll set up camp um, we'll go hut to hut doing evangelism, inviting everybody out to the open air meeting in the evening. And, and then after the open air meeting uh, in the evening, usually there's uh, crowds of people uh, that, that have questions or um, that need counsel, usually going to bed at about uh, one in the morning, getting up at about five in the morning for a prayer meeting. And then I usually teach a class from about six in the morning to one in the afternoon. At one in the afternoon, we jump in the boat and go on to the next village and do the whole thing over again. Um, there is so much need, so much need. In Peru, I think uh, just as in much of South America, it's about 95% Catholic. Um, really, it's Catholicism, uh, where they're very nominal Catholics. In the jungle, most people are very animistic and uh, don't even have any connection with, uh, with Catholicism. Um, many, many times I've preached the gospel to the whole village as the whole village will come out to listen to me. And uh, before I ever showed up in the villages, no one had ever seen a white person before. And so uh, uh, I was sort of a novelty and people would come out to listen. Basically, the only things to do in these villages, fight, fornicate, and get drunk. 
And so when the gringo, American, would come from the United States into their village to preach, it was a great form of entertainment to come and uh, watch me, the wild man, preach on top of a table. And uh, a great form of entertainment for them. So they would come out and many, many times I have ended up preaching and sort of to a stunned crowd afterwards. And someone will come up to me and say, I want what you're talking about. New life in Christ. Judgment day is coming. And you're telling me God became a man and walked this planet, lived the perfect life. He paid the price that I should have had to pay on the cross. I can be forgiven of all my sin. The chains can fall off. I can be born again, meaning and significance. I want it. Give it to me. But at the same time, after saying that, many times they will turn away and say, but I love my sin more than I love Jesus. And it's heartbreaking to see them walk away as if the chains, spiritual chains, are still draped over their shoulders and, and, and chained onto their legs as they walk away from the freedom that's offered to them in Christ. But you know, on one side, it's almost encouraging to me when that happens because they're counting the cost. Oftentimes, I'll share the gospel with people here in the United States, and they'll be kind of like, ooh, ooh. I've heard that a million times. I got saved when I was three years old, and then again when I was seven, and then again when I was 13, and again when I was 15. I hate the church. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. I don't want to have anything to do with other Christians. But bless God, I'm saved. That person is not saved. We need to preach a biblical gospel where people count the cost. Missions, someone has explained it this way. It's like one man letting another man down into a septic tank or down into a well, and he's letting them down by a rope. The guy that's going down is like the missionary, and he's getting dirty, and he's going down there, and he's holding on to that rope, but the guy at the top of the well, they're letting him down. He's letting him down, and he's got rope burns on his hands as he's supporting the guy going down. Either way, whether you're the guy at the bottom or you're the guy at the top, show me the scars on your hands. Let me end with this story. Um, I wanna give significant time to Christian also. I guess he'll talk a little bit about CMML. We're both CMML commended missionaries. Um, the Lord has my wife and our kids and I based in the States for a time but uh, still very much trying to, we're trying to raise up a new generation that will go forward with the gospel, preaching the gospel, making disciples, planting churches, uh, missions, making Christ's name great among the nations. Let me uh, give you this example and then hand it over to Christian. One day, we had a knock at the door. Brother Usias from one of the villages one of the villages, he had come to visit me. It was one of the villages of the natives, the Eseja Indians. They talk like this. Anybody understand that? Not, kind of like Malayalam? No? So Brother Usias came and he, and he looked very distraught and he just, something had happened and he said, Brother Mikeas, you'll never believe what just happened. And he told me this story, he said, one of the senoritas in, in the village had just given birth to a baby boy. And the baby boy, after about a week, had come down with a common cold. And, and the mother placed the baby in the hammock there next to the hut, and uh, just hoping the baby would get better, but not really paying much attention. Brother Usias came by and saw that the baby was sick and said, hey, we need to get this, this baby to the clinic upriver. The, the, the city, the town is upriver, has a, has a clinic there, there's a, you know, a hospital, we can give the baby good medical attention and, and uh, we'll take care of this common cold here. We don't want it to complicate and get, get a little bit worse. And so the mother said, no, just leave the baby there in the hammock, he'll get better. She completely ignored the baby. Next day, Usias came to see how the baby was doing. Asked the mother, how, how's the baby? And the baby's there, the baby was worse. And the mother was just ignoring the baby, just leaving him there in the ha hammock, not taking care of him at all. And Brother Usia said, look, we need to take the baby upriver 
get some medical attention, it could, could kind of complicate into a grave situation. The baby could die. And she just shrugged it off. No, the baby's okay. It costs a lot of money to go upriver. We're going to have to buy gasoline to put in the picket picket boat here to get upriver. And, and it's hot and it's uncomfortable. Just leave the baby. It'll get better. The next day, Usias comes. And the baby was, it was a grave situation. The baby, he could tell, was starting, he, was, he could die. And he takes the mother by the hand and says, I'll pay for the gasoline. We'll get in that boat. We've got to save the baby's life. And so he puts the gasoline in. They get in the boat. It's about four, four hours going up river. It is hot. The sun is beating down on them. And Usias comes in. They run out of gas, so he's got to... He's got more gasoline to pour into the engine, and so he goes over on the shore, and, and as he's putting gasoline in the engine, he goes to the mother, and he says, how's the baby now? There's just about two more turns to get to the clinic, and we'll be there. We can really save the baby's life, and how's the baby doing? And the mother, without any emotion in her face, she looks at Usias and says, oh, the baby died about an hour ago. Usias, what? The baby... The baby's dead? Where is he? And he's looking through the sheets and everything where the baby was wrapped up. Where's the baby? She said, I threw him overboard. You threw him overboard? Where's the baby? You threw the baby overboard? And there's no emotion in the mother's face, kind of shrugging her shoulders. Oh, he was going to die anyway. And as I was hearing this story, I'm just filled with indignation. How can there exist a mother so indifferent, cold-hearted toward her own child? And hopefully you're feeling the same way right now as you hear that story. But you know what? We're no different than that mother oftentimes as Christians. The world is going to hell. There's so much need everywhere. While we just sit back in our comfortable chairs and watch TV and gather together at wonderful Christian conferences, while people need the gospel, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. The next time it rains, it's going to be fire and brimstone. Oh, that Lord, the Lord would raise up a new generation of Christians to go out into the mission field, making Christ's name great. As soon as you walk out of this room, you're going into the mission field. I'm not talking about you have to go to Peru or you have to go to China or Afghanistan or some other place. Just preach the gospel where you are right here. Show me the scars on your hands. Father God, we thank you for your word and how it spells out your great love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, I pray that you would put it into our hearts, a burning passion to make Christ's name great wherever we go. Pray that you would raise up an army of evangelists and preachers and teachers out of this group right here, some that would go back to India, to the north of India, into the hardest places on the planet, taking the gospel to the most needy people. So much need everywhere, right here in Dallas, Texas. Pray that you would stamp eternity on our eyeballs, an eternal perspective, here for such a short amount of time. Stamp eternity on our eyeballs. We long to make a difference in this world for you and for your glory and your great cause. We put our lives into your hands, asking that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.